some stoolish today instead of cherish. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I know there was, I, I was sitting with Peter and Ken got here. <laughs> I cherish the fact that you're here. <laughs> there, there was the notorious Charles Bernstein reading where we had been out in Kathy Seidman's loft and we did a, a reading for, uh, it must have been for Talisman when the Boston issue of that came out. And there were like 90 people in there. And we thought, this is great. We've got a spot. People are showing up. And so uh, there was, I forget how it came about, but it was fairly quickly when, uh, when Charles threw me in town. I said, We've got, we're up and running again from the old location. He said, great. So we all assembled out there, I think, including Miss Seidman, myself, and Joe Tora. I think there was two people there. <laughs> and at the end of the whole thing, one, and Charles gave his reading like, like there was a thousand people in the audience. It was actually humbling to watch. But at the end, this guy came running into the room and said, is this where the reading is? <laughs> I said, yeah. You're about an hour and a half late. Anyhow, um, let me switch out things here. Let us start um, here today. The great form is without shape. All life long, you are unhanding, unhanding, and unhanding what was handed to you. All life long. You throw out the line of life. You throw out the line stinging up from your guts. Were they planting trees, your father and your mother? Did they ever plant? Is that a line of trees far away, a green line? All life long, you include something that includes your life. You are in the egg. In the center of a picture, two angels hold a transparent crystal egg a teardrop shape. In the egg, the ocean god is thrown, left leg crossed over right, trident in right hand. Under his outstretched arms, two children, a little people, stand, a boy at his right, a girl at his left. The boy's head is crowned with a sun, the girl's with a crescent moon. That's the middle level of the picture. At the top, a blazing sun with human features dominates the vertical axis. At the bottom, a man and a woman kneel on either side, a furnace, man to right of the furnace, woman to the left. In the furnace itself, directly below the egg containing the god, is suspended a similar egg, empty. All life long, the dew falls from heaven. All life long, trees climb up from underground waters. In the seed of the old god, the new gods are swarming. Earth is ready for planting. The shut eye is opening. The heat. That's Garrett Lansing our dear friend who we lost this winter. And um, since then, I've been trying to read through his poems, uh, read one here each time, uh, dedicate the series to him for the rest of the year, and move toward, um, in the fall, what I hope will be a complete reading of The Heavenly Tree. It grows downward, the first edition. I'll be recruiting voices and things um, <laughs> when, when we get ready to do this and, and see how the time comes. But the, uh, the loss of Garrett is, is a dear one, and, um, and the, the shadow that he cast from Gloucester was always a, a warm shadow to stand in. And um, so we need to do something to uh, acknowledge his work and to continue that work as we go. And I might want to add that the Gloucester Writers' Center now has the memorial reading up. So if anybody wants to listen to oh, really? the oh, memorial wow. reading, you can just go to the Gloucester Writers' Center. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, today is a double delight. Um, one of the things of running a, a series, uh, when I finally let go of myself and have to uh, know everything and everyone that I bring in here, is to discover new work. And uh, when Ken uh, and I, who had been communicating back and forth on Facebook for a while, um, decided that we could do this reading, uh, he asked if Peter Moore could come up and flip me his book, and I took one look at it and 
recognized there uh, several things. One, this was somebody who I don't know at all, who was doing a, an immensely broad amount of work and uh, teaching and projects. It's just wonderful to sit and read through your biography and realize uh, if, if this is one of those untapped people that uh, you know is amongst us now, and uh, we will suck off your energy here and uh, try to. You know, a little of you here. When I went to the work, it, it, it was just a, a fine, wry, uh, beautiful poetry that, um, that it was strange and different and the kind of thing that belongs right here in this room. And so it is wonderful to welcome you here. Please welcome Peter Moore. Fueling the gather in vacant lots. Morning molts more hands than there are sirens to pull. Hands here implies a person paid by the hour, whereas siren suggests a kind of shed. After the rain, the Lord hath said, there will be rain in the way you talk. After the talk, the shed hath said, if you drown in your work, we will have to cut the most beautiful thing from your lungs. A pattern for local deferments. Yes, some suffering, but also a way of saying when. Uh, it's really great to be with everyone today. Thank you, Michael, for hosting this reading. It's, it's, it's really special. Uh, Ken and I are both kindred spirits from the American South. Uh, my first trip to Boston was actually uh, to meet Garrett. Uh, he gave me a tour of Gloucester. Because um, I, I was still working on a scholarly project on Charles Olson, and so when I got in contact with Bill Corbett, he was like, you have to meet Garrett. And so it's nice to be here, and uh, it's nice to hear you uh, read the poem, so thanks so much. Uh, what I'm going to be reading from mostly today is, is a new book called Zippers and Jeans. The title is from a song by a musician named Harlan T. Bobo, a Memphis musician. The book uh, is set in Memphis. and takes Memphis as its site of investigation. Um, there are three voices um, that you'll hear. Uh, one's narrative, one is lyric, and one is kind of essayistic. And the narrative voice tells the story of a man who lo loses the love of his life um, to another woman. And upon having his heart broken, finds that he can commune with inanimate objects. And the lyrics are the objects speaking. And they speak in the form of Exeter riddles, like medieval Exeter riddles. And then the essays are uh, kind of cultural studies pieces on, like documentary pieces on the kind of uh, vernacular culture of Memphis. Uh, and those are called Notes Towards the Poetics of Little Substance. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to read straight through. Um, The sky slash heaven over Memphis. Every time a man walks into a bar, an angel gets an eye exam. <laughs> Dehydrated in the days counting down to our breakup, I fall asleep watching Wings of Desire and wake up with a Charlie horse the size of West Germany. A man repossessed by his muscles, I stagger into the kitchen and drink the juice from a jar of pickles, each spear eaten by the love of my life. The brine shines my chin. The angel, Damiel, hears human thought take shape like a <coughs> pin never leaving the page, and trades immortal telepathy for a glass of empty calories and love. If these walls could talk, my life would be an inside joke. And so part of the narrative, I said that was all I was going to say, part of the narrative involves, in, in the kind of aftermath of this breakup, uh, another character comes along named Early, and the speaker and Early have a kind of um, category-defining relationship. Scenes from a hemorrhage. Number one. Horn-rimmed nights of hand-me-downs, humid drinks, and cigarette butts smooth flat under feet. The heart 
The hardest part about getting your front teeth knocked out is finding a donor. That's why they call it a partial. I would like to help you, but I'm kind of partial to this whole having all my teeth thing. <coughs> Two. Marx once said, outside a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> it is inside a dog dark when Early walks up to the bar at Murphy's. Between sets, I can hear her tell the bartender, Remember last week when I fell off the handlebars and face-planted in the parking lot? She flicks her tongue and out pops the partial. Three. The beer signs give me migraines. At least you have your teeth. It's only a matter of time before they have to be pulled. Soft with rot, I say. Soft with rot, she insists. Check your tile runs into unoccupied corners. A heavy door slams home. Four. We take a cab to my place. Playing the tourist, we ask our driver, what kind of work do people do in this town? Well, I have lots of friends and all of them are taxi driver. So I think most people in Memphis drive the taxi. Five. I want to wake up a house painter and run one leg after another into stiff, bri stiff bridges, delinquent brush strokes, bright striping, rough hewn canvas. Early gazes at the ceiling from a frameless mattress, comprehending the floor. Works for jerks, she replies. Sleeps for creeps, I insist. The day opens up to us like a conversation mouthed between extras on the edge of a shot. Not to advance the plot, our talk is small. The muralist must paint over windows on occasion. In Doodad's Den. When Early asks me how I found out about the love of my life and the other woman, I waltz over to my dresser and place my, my ear tight against the wood grain. My eyes swell, head rocks back. I retreat to a candle lying on the windowsill and run its unlit wick into the quick of my cochlea. My arms push the stick away, only to thrust it back, once more, cold and uncompromising, to my face. Like Lawrence Welk's little baton, I stand in the center of the room, craning my neck to every corner. <laughs> when my glance falls on the hamper, it holds forth. When I spy the ceiling fan, it snitches. On a ripple of sin, my, bri my bridegroom season came to an end when a SIM card shared with me the secret of sexuality. <laughs> the answer to the riddle is cell phone. Bound with rings, my speech brings the country into custody, herds the hive into honeycomb cages, killer of correspondence, spiller of skeletons. My calling can be traced to a single whisper. Come here, he said. I want to see you. You who have stood in doorways of darkened rooms for days, proclaiming, I am spiritually lonely. I am sorry, but you have reached a relationship that is no longer in service. If you feel that you have reached this message in error, please listen carefully to the following menu options. If you ask yourself, repeatedly, where has my love been spending her nights? Press 3. If washing fruit makes you cry, Press four. Wait one moment while we direct your pain. We here at Objects Anonymous know your sense of personal dignity is valuable, but the love of your life is currently showering, and there is no one available to prevent you from fine-toothing my text messages. There you will find a history of how long till we see each other again, till we go away for a weekend, till we tell him. There you will find cold sores keeping her from kissing another woman's crotch, from sharing sips at the Madison Flame. After the tone, she will return and realize my knowledge has fallen into your terrible form. You will coyly remove the towel, leaving her to dry in the air of your crimes. You will press a kiss into her slick mouth, and she will goad your gulping at the ends inside her. Deceptive environment. The street I grew up on, I visit nightly, 
as part of an elaborate ritual to trick the mind out of objectifying sleep. I count the house numbers like sheep, down to the empty plot at the mouth of the dilemma. There I build a black box theater. There I wake up with chest pains all over my body. Haben Sie ein Tattoo on your Glockenspiegel? Number one. The first time Early invites me in, it's Ray's weekend to have Adler. Smoke them if you got them, she tells me, on her way to the back room, handing me an ashtray carved in the shape of two low-hanging human lungs. Charred letters protrude from the pink receptacle. Let's be friends. <laughs> Two. I think for a moment of her stepping out of the simple skirt she wears to clean client homes in central gardens. I think for a moment of my student at the cafeteria table snapping a discarded chicken leg in half with his teeth, flashing me the marrow. The night air deadens distant train sounds. This is what the dog wants when it chews the bone. Three. Early tells me her ex died of an overdose working as a set painter in New York. Later I make the mistake of asking her if a new movie is better than a new reality. She replies, maybe it is, but that's not your line. Peaches and penumbras. One. When your duplex starts to resemble a hideout, newspaper for napkins, sink for a toolbox, smoke rising out of a dead man's chest, executed, executioner style, in a, paper in a paperback pressed open in the crisper drawer, crisper drawer, it makes sense to go to the grocery store. Two, a bird caught between sensor door, you must start over. A bird caught between sensor doors perches on the suggestion box padlock. If you like what you see, please let us know. Three. When I walk out that door, I will be at the bottom of the sea. I said this to the love of my life upon discovering her dalliances. At the checkout, a train of knuckle-dragging mouth breathers assembles. Their boy with his baby teeth and bleached out camo tea, contrives a conquest for sweet tarts, screams his head off. In answer to his terrible interjection, we turn our backs. The sea has nothing on checkout traffic. The back of the line is cool. The chorus of consolation rings out from the rafters. The answer to the riddle is supermarket. In ventilation panel, my box populi. In fluorescent hum, my eidolon. Like box tops blowing in the wind, I lend proof of apocalyptic purchase to the pill-addled pilgrim. I inspire in the hope-hymned plebeian an edible complex of global proportion. I am the light you make of the time it takes to restock misfortune. I am the section 8 of expiration dates. And you, you have come from the far shores of cell phone satori, you who have come to clutch hush in the company of quiet commodities, you must suffer the dream where you stand to be done in by dreams. Two lovesick fiends, lost in the Muzak, sing, boys don't cry overspangled in dive. But piped in pretend soon gives way to delirium as her blood sugar descends. Panic sets in. I can't breathe. I need to leave. This is the blatant sweetness strife wipes from a faded mouth. This is where language stops and starts blinking. <coughs> Slacken your grasp from the red handle guard. Surrender under surveillance your sweaty perishables.
There is no gift economy in the ethnic foods. No canned hand in hand at the end cap of the mind. As for how the simple life is made, start with sausage and work your way back to squeal. Love is the factory farm of the real. Groove. I wear a tie and make a living yelling at children. <laughs> a flimmy cathode the size of an oyster crops up on my vocal cords. Just yesterday, I silenced an entire cafeteria with a hay that could pop a balloon at 40 paces. The principal tells me I am finally getting the hang of public education. <laughs> Poetry, I say to my last period, is language charged to the utmost degree. Okay. I got three more, and the last one's one of the, the essay pieces. Dailies. One. Last night I, dream, I dreamed the last episode of a sitcom I've never seen, starring myself as an inner-city English teacher who moonlights as a therapist for objects. <laughs> Turns out all the objects I ever want to talk about is my problems. <laughs> Two. Up ahead of the alarm, I wait for some sign to step back into the bruised fruit of casual mythology. The woolen light of street lamps silences to mind a semicircle of floods and spots illuminating the cast and crew. Champ champagne chills off to the side of this, the final shot. Three. A steady cam trails the clownish star up the steps of the house and into my study. He reaches behind the bookcase, grabbing the book I hid from myself when the breakup had just broke. The answer to the riddle is the first English edition of Milan Kundera's The Joke. My body is an off-colored postcard from which the cinder's record never recovers. My body is like a belligerent postcard. My body is a black insignia camp where the state tramples the heart from its sleeve. My, heart, my body is like an internment camp. My body is a beautiful demolition wheezing hysterical under a burnt out sky my body is like a theory of demolition. And you, you who are more the object than the subject of your story, you who are hid, you who hid me under the bookcase and with me the memory of her holding me in a brown paper sack on the edge of the bed in that long motel where you met her after work. How you searched for an inscription and were relieved when you saw she wrote nothing to depreciate my resale value. Foolish man, the simple life is the opium of the masses. Mint condition stinks of materialism. Long live Blavatsky. It is not a broken heart that lets you hear the secrets objects share. Come, lower your pan, into my pages and repeat after me. If a noun is a person, place, or thing, then place is the seam connecting people to things. And this is the last one. So a lot of the essays deal with uh, kind of arcane piece of musical equipment called a uh, Silvertone 1484 amp. It's a tube amp. 
Um, <coughs> and there's kind of an argument being made in the essays that it is kind of the distinctive uh, Memphis sound, and it's an argument for distortion and its relationship to lyrical um, excess. And so uh, the last essay kind of touches upon some of those things. Um, and the book kind of holds up as, a, as, a, as an underhero, uh, local Memphis musician, Jack Oblivion. Um, and uh, you'll find some of that here. So there's an epigraph. And before I finish, I just want to say again, thank you for having me here. It's been a beautiful event and what a wonderful space. Notes towards the poetics of literal, little substance. Eight. Have you ever seen a human body in a pawn shop? <laughs> Jack Oblivion. No. Have you? No, but I heard about it. Like somebody pawns their prosthetic leg. Jack Oblivion. <laughs> They're hard up for money then. The few times I've actually tried to sell something to a pawn shop, they never offered any money. Like one time, it was a silver tone amp, and I think they wanted like five bucks. Another time, my high school class ring, and they didn't even want it. Not even five dollars. And I was like, fucking shit. L.A. record. I come back to this, sorry, I come back to the discography of it. So low. The 1998 release by Jack Oblivion. Quiet, multi-instrumentalist multi and singer who contributed to almost every influential garage band in Memphis, Memphis's 1990s rebirth scene. As the title of the album suggests, going it alone in the music industry, without the familiar comforts of group success, opens one up to new levels of depravity. So low is Jack's most poetic recording. Poetic in the sense that it thinks most directly about the problem of the lyric poem. The irrigation of an individuated subject position for the purpose of lamenting the very idea of individuation. The stage name Jack Oblivion amplifies and distorts the personal experiences of the isolated musician, Jack Yarber, his real name. In the same way, the eye amplifies and distorts the personal experiences of the isolated poet. With a spirit of restless urgency, the album opens on the singer serenading his beloved, a midnight hour queen on the cover of a punk rock magazine. In the title track, he parodies the soloist's ambition, warbling, with an electric guitar, you're going to go far, but you're going back home to that same old bar. While the lyrical content addresses the problems of aestheticized personhood, the delivery dramatizes the soloist's complaint. There is something too large pushing everything Jack sings. This expressionless mode is a matter of tone, the placid tone of death brought to life, death manifest as vivid indifference and lucid obstruction. It is the silver, ethereal sound of depth beaten to death. Near the end, Jack chants, I'm tired of being a human being. I'm tired of being a human being. The phrase transcends the body of the singer. It is the sound of Otis, despondent on the dock bay, the staple singers, realizing that heavy is what makes you happy, and it is the sound of Elvis, last seen alive in public on August 7, 1977. As legend has it, he had rented out Liberty Land, the amusement park at Memphis's Mid-South Fairgrounds, where he rode his favorite roller coaster, the Zippin' Pippin', for hours that night, without ceasing, cycling through the track again and again, searching for some way out. Thank you.
things that a great press does is I mean, it puts out books that get carried off into time, of course. But it also starts to bump people together that wouldn't otherwise get bumped together uh, from location or you know, age, you name it. There's any number of reasons why we don't find each other in poetry and, and literature. And one of the joys of the last few years, uh, last few years, it's been 10 years, it's been press wafer, which is uh, there's at least Ruth, me, and our next reader, Mr. Taylor, are all um, the benefits of Mr. Corbett's Breast Wafer, um, which has uh, published such a, a broad uh, number of different writers. Um, and, and again, uh, as with finding you, Peter, uh, it, you know, books come in the door when you subscribe to Press Wafer, and you should all do so. Okay. Um, and uh, it would have been a book that would have been sitting at the Grolier that I would, would have noticed if I saw it. Um, but it's easy to miss things. And suddenly a book came in the door that said, you know, self-portrait is just as Joseph Cornell, and uh, Joseph Cornell's a favorite of mine, and I s said, what the heck is this? And uh, sat down with it and was absolutely just dumbfounded, blown away by the, um, the breadth of that little book. It's small, it's sitting up here along with Peter's book. And uh, I kept, this will maybe make you fall out of your chair with laughter or horror, but I, I kept thinking of Zukowski as I was reading this book, uh, the level of uh, the line manipulation, the enjambment, the uh, tension to rhyme. Uh, uh, it recalls 80 flowers to me, and it's, it's not as uh, impenetrable as 80 flowers by any stretch of the imagination, because you keep coming back to the self-portrait, um, which is just sings along and intrigues with all the little compartmentalized possibilities that Cornell offers up to any of us in poetry. So it's uh, with a great deal of pleasure uh, that um, I bring Mr. Taylor here. He's a poet, he's a publisher, uh, and doing magnificent photographs that, I mean, the minute we Facebooked up, uh, your photographs coming across the board, uh, uh, all from around Black Mountain, uh, were just uh, perpetual reasons to actually turn Facebook on in the morning <laughs> and, and look at things. So long overdue, and I'm so happy to have him here. Please welcome Ken Taylor. Whichever way Brooklyn is, you see that? Yes. Um, so these are these are collage sonnets, so they're all short. So I hope they don't wear you out, and then I'll read some new stuff. First one is called Sunday. In the country we dine on loins of the deer adapt to any waterfowl hunting conditions, all fair game. When I pop the hood and read the dipstick, I think of Dad. The dog breezes to catch what's coming. We have to wait. I have to wear camo to get lost in the open. Lost cameos. Toads skulk ruins of berries and end bugs that took the squash down. In town, the undertaker abandons fluids and scalpel Flex removed from inscription or swept from the foot of a headstone. We fly above, beyond all skies that would kill us. Postprandial, I gargle <coughs> to get you out of my mouth, off my eyes and fingers. This is called When We Go Up On Our Lines. The woods offer nothing ophthalmic, only painted flats. Eyes adjust and catch stars in places embarrassing to all of us. Don't know why a system north, Illinois Central Station's gone. We buy extra terracotta to bridge the stagger, recalling what we left like several bottom holes behind the fourth wall that took and never gave back. My cowboy theme fixed in the basement didn't distract you from keeping your last name. We rehearsed scare quotes so the stage fright wouldn't show. 
It's not that I couldn't cry. I was short and antimicrobial aside. Hands lend hyssop from the wings. This is called also Sprach Zarathustra. And this, I got the idea for this poem based on a Brian Eno album where he had a whole bunch of musicians play that song and none of them played the instrument that they actually played. <laughs> the philosophy behind the song is the song. The song, not the song, is a song to weather or picking your teeth with Nietzsche's pointed shoes. That eternal recurrence of the same, of the same. We found caning from a chair in the dithyrambic scamper around a fire pit. Let's talk to a dog in the dark about binomial nomenclature or that this is a business trip. Jupiter rises with wind of another squall again over crisping marshmallows and sparks jumping into a brown tilting green, sapphic feet shining with toe rings and all loss insisting circular breath, halting minuet, losing God by twilight shame, cover crop puce too brief to land an epithet. This is called Mobius syndrome. I have different sort of um, sequences that happen in this, and one of them is different syndrome poems, and most of them are based on city names, like Stockholm syndrome, and there's a Paris syndrome, and a Jewish room syndrome. This is Mobius syndrome, and it's a neurological disorder where you're kind of born with a paralyzed face. So people think you're dumb when you're just kind of staring at them. Pardon my stare, but is that mid-century hair? The clown moment from a celebrated kisser? In the bicycle factory, I tried to keep my notice down, but couldn't swallow their smirking. Mine is the mask of the first son who screwed it up, a matter of spectrum swap and dewdrop, tall twist in my skeleton costume static look outside of all training. Eventually, we each determine the need for coded speech and note the best way to stop the beatings is to quit making sound. Put your dancing on my eyes again before this bastard asphodel hatch and the brittle sheep crumple, unconscious of my circus catch. This is another syndrome form. It's called Paris syndrome. Uh, it's also called Paris Shokugan. It happens to Japanese tourists who come to Paris for some reason and are overcome by the reality of the city and they just, they just collapse. I guess it, <laughs> this is a real thing. It's a real thing. It, uh, I guess in, in the beginning people thought it was just like a high end problem of high end tourists, but it's actually the Japanese embassy is not flooded with these people. But I think they see, I think I read somewhere that the you know, we all think of Paris as the postcards and the, you know, just after the World War II look and, and just the whole pulse of the city, I think, is too much for Japanese tourists for whatever reason. Uh, Paris Syndrome. Como se va in the fourth arrondissement, hit like a breaker from Hokusai, scattering sake <coughs> and pick that hamachi. Her tachycardia not sinking with Fukushima haute couture. Billboard glimmer and pill hats from home, no match for can can oomph and escargot, and end in gargoyle double soup. Silk hair question marks spread out below her toppled chair. How to say over wasabi flecked lips, miss can't maunder there, summoning cherry bow hoku at Lanka Cord in Japanese and sans French accent, or this diminishing again. Bracing serviette restores a fox blink. Paper fingers push through the door. I'm going to read some new stuff and come back to this so it's, there's a little variety. So these are uh, from a manuscript I've been working on for a little while. It's called Aromancy Garage. Aromancy is kind of like taking the auspices, except it's divination by weather cloud forms. And so all these forms, the vehicle for them is cloud. So a cloud in the shape of a cold case is the first one. 
It's not going to end well for Bob. I know this after Briolage by string. She meets someone in a B-filmed alley. It's sure to come back day for night, blue on a close-up of pretend. His foe slinks around glitter off the motor lodge deep end, cast a sketch based on real-life drama, and while I don't know the instrument, I can guess the style of brunt trauma or the proxy that radio is safe for the good guy, for the hero patter. No cleavage in radio, born from scraping Los Feliz rent or an epoxy to cure vaporized, served as prime. The pigtailed fraulein can be conjured from sputum in back of the mouth instead of roughed out by smearing until he chews scenery at the window, losing more with each smaller plate of dinner theater. The crane shot fades to a skewed frame that plucks heartless, which brings me to the part set behind the sliding barrier to entry, admitting spatter, but not woe. Hogan, I know nothing, nothing. That was the death of Bob Crane. This is called Cloud in the Shape of a Cloth over a Birdcage. Unknown sleeping, sometimes known as perching, is stray from a plumed range of thinking and last cornering, stalling, gathering a dark blend with good airflow covering a cloche to prevent dust and exterior glow, esteemed a banquet for others in mouthfuls of toasted notes. Moving lips wake from a starling dream of three descents to rise, Transdermal delivery of forethought, cursive script raising discursive strew, lion, ass, hyena, snake, dragon, fire, ape, seven the measure of spatial correlation at the wrist curve of sky, the custron spilling an elemental mashup, calling all seers across murmuration. A theme of brindle whip stitch, whip stitch scallops from far away. So tender in a ceremony of tipple flutes, sparks, passerine vessels, exhausting count, chased to collecting by threats at the edge, <coughs> more a gouge than a knife, spinning the nearest neighbor theory, tossed in scale-free correlation across meadows, mimicking bones in a labyrinth of gyra. Skull clocked and seeing stars as spectrum swap is a ticking dance in preface to adagios Sejura awaiting seizure before a pulsed apparition strikes blue, splitting night into seed music, likeness of light inside chambers, praise song raised to celestial apprehension. This is called Cloud in the Shape of the Goths. The film in question is a counting animal with lines applied and scorn, sloping starboard and viewed more times due to a clickbait ornament. It tries to wipe the link between those that dreamed of the gayest hardcore punk and a mini lesson of mortuary scaring peasants to church. Your drop down is a glade on the lower Danube, lingering in the chill waves of baptismal water, if only out of respect for the dead. The new need to spoilers to spread the weight of tall walls, matching savagery with kissing, their banners lifting damp and reducing sperm count. Please remember to use blood as an accent color to boost announcing in your mirror. Why raise a rain gutter when you can create a monster? The bondage pants of debutantes may formulate a buttress to sorrow, but any backwoods thinker struggles to solve medieval problems, like snake handling the sense that Bella Lugosi's dead, striving to be exact in a manner that is soured, knowing the vaulted ceiling is a workhorse and corpse paint referring to pale complexity. Your vampire singing may be stuck on horizontal, but is cruel to the return of black gloss in the but is crucial to the return of black gloss in the trailer park. Threnody exposed with the slow shutter finger. Truth always trying to behold the plot behind clear story math, the armature of pipe masonry edging the release of light. This is called In Case of Fire, Spill, or Release. The flight attendant drops his register to make up for a dearth of girlfriends, says, our lunch is only possible with bees or the wind. 
thought bubbles <coughs> exercise angst throughout the cabin. Exercise is two fingers, three things. 4B wants more fig leaf. 4C, a slip and slide. All other hands re-blue guns and upset that numinous boarding hierarchy. Trending now, bird strike. Our co-pilot lapses on the names of mountains. Her cockpit succumbs to bean vine tendrils and deveining begins. The pilot steers by dust up from dry lake beds, stick and rudder man from way back. Engine one declares a new pope. Engine two, pagans make better lovers. This is called uh, Taking the Auspices. Murder falls on the fontanelle of a red tail hawk, collective clawback caw, mouthful of wide mouth bass boat, green and visible in shallows, trees front wood thrush song, tellurium praise to hoe cakes and hominy and hoppin' john. Covey of bob white quail said baraka, said duncan, said pound, said pear upside down cake and square root of pie. Not enough lungs to go around. Robins activate rapport with the deity, blue one, red four, yellow zero. Lenient owl decree, two geese fly north, northeast. No faith in scuppernong and washboard, overdraft of the aquifer. Buzzards roost with wet wings. This is uh, called on the trail of the dinosaur in the 70s. I used to do oil exploration. That's what we called it, being on the tail of the trail of the dinosaur. And um, I lived with basically the Hell's Angels and reprobates and lampsters <laughs> of the West. And one of the guys who was our crew chief was named Barry Snyder. And he was a very intense guy, and so we called him Barely Slightly. <laughs> and so this poem reflects him. Barely slightly sank into his love seat and purified wings of ecstasy before the egg to silk effect, heirloom twelve gauge blast, and witnessed desire if used in moderation, which he didn't do, will keep many of soul afloat, splatter, self inflicted kick drum on the ballad, on the one, afferent autumn champ and shut, he's another matter now. Barely slightly dropped a magic poncho at the smallest ask, jaw thrust to alpine view, Escanio spread, Rorschach test in lieu of stud finder all over the double wide wall paper, <coughs> oil patch buckshot and pull back to cul-de-sac, to troposphere, to firmament. This is called casting couch. I was an actor for a while. Uh, didn't do much acting, actually. Um, not sure why concertina wire by the entry, box kite bound to semblance of soul instead of cupcakes. Even after the festival, we run out of tissues in the car. If I could only tend fires or abandon them or quit coveting their ominous weather, hold them calls across state lines. One of measure wants Irish whiskey or more bird song than swipe fee disclosure. Engineering keeps our laps warm so we drive to the other Starbucks. The membership looks promising. If this were a sandwich, we'd cut it diagonally. All glitter and cattle call accrual and pirouettes and debris fields, zero turn radius. No room to figure out the part I didn't get. All right, I got two more of these, I'll read, but I'll read a couple of these for you. Uh, this is called cloud in the shape of an air gap. Air gap is when you isolate some sensitive data from the internet. So there's actually, uh, can't jump it supposedly, but I guess our state governments are able to do that. So this kind of talks about that. Cloud in the sh shape of an air gap is ducking the X for Y format and use of nonce words. What's said means tagging each thing and its reverse in perfect forward secrecy foisted for bigger. The trees are seed cabinets, grass hostility beneath the flower process, doing the work of pillage, edit, erase. In the pad crashed for keys to decipher a smudge of lilac thrown away by memory. 
Love is turned on joy in clean cascades, not paranoid enough. Paranoid enough. Citizen, the smallest of grace notes, and a string of friends marking themselves safe in wreckage. The shortest route home has been found. Take providence. There comes a time when attribution dressed in pansy is the meaning, a field of heart's ease between those that joined exploiting and the other outside of ride sharing. Black boxes don't tally attrition like the allure behind curtain auroras. Bromides steal melody from a long limbed song and speak of buzz cut days frozen in wavy borders, diving under falling stars and bars for glory. It starts to mean lost early. Satellites track the non-magnetic, drawn to touching private space by means of achievement badges, ribbons, breaking points to govern every hued breath. Those that bought the turn of the screw also bought the dead. Behind spook speak runs tough passages, plain clothes not always a cloak, logging keystrokes as salted truths to be harder to hack, exposing a target with hay-colored hair, paying in cash still traceable. The fenced-in portion not taking back talk, ticking red next to freedom of intrusion. Rapid eye is more clock, siphoned from hibiscus modeling flash drives and a fest shrift for three-letter agency. Bite down on popcorn time and hug a cushion to your chest as hush-hush streams by what looks to be a locked door. This is called Cloud in the Shape of Sun Ra. <laughs> How brave of the moth straight into the grill, a lumen victim in search of praise. I'm not bug hunting with a taste for spilled blood, packing ethereal jars, hoping to add pattern to collection. I'm keeping wheels between reflections and listening to him long down. Can't tell what vapors are up, if there's moon stew dancing through pews, negotiating with people of earth and fellow travelers of the empty foxhole, behind the side man, beside himself, out in front of water vapor recycling the thing. There's always another thing in a universe as big as this, dotted by samples darkened at the spine. Fixed wings will not deliver chance clefts, will defect to mid-fidelity, ending a return to the most evil place, brotherly love. Egyptian system cut with Alabama gatefold sleeve, 180 gram vinyl means a thicker record of the back rows lit by high beams hitting a row of diamonds, the interstellar meeting ground for God's appointment. This is called Cloud in the Shape of Adjustment. Her trunk application is electric twitch in a blanket of wet heat during a dry rendition of Dean Martin's Bad Ice that serves as preamble to the rated premises feeling. If running shoes sit in the sun for a while, they're cheaper online, she tenders above the client face down in crepe examination paper, coveting a version of what's covering, covering his feet. His mind is rotating tires. Hers aims to best Sudoku. He pictures brittle passed off as homemade among potlucks between rockabilly sets, driving tattoos and dulcet innuendo. She ponders limerence while studying the stiffened state where misalignment found by expert touching leads to the soft request to exhale and his neck snapping. Later, her fingers dig two digits into the appointment calendar, his eyes released down the road not taken. They swap damage in the banter of copay before he triggers the bell that signals an entrance or an exit. Yeah, I'll read these two poems and I'll, I'll just stop. Uh, this first one is called Cloud in the Shame of Gnosis. It was written after watching Nathaniel Mackey read at the Whitney, Whitney Museum, uh, which is part of the open plan celebrating T Cecil Taylor in, in, in 2016. Fifth floor of the Whitney, 17,000 feet of open space dedicated to Cecil Taylor. And the bass player Henry Grimes was playing with him. I don't know if you know Henry, but he's what, pushing 90. Uh, jazz guy. Just, there's the phrase, you know, real gone. Through. This dude is like way gone. Mm -hmm. um, and in writing something to capture what I felt there, I, you know, writing a poem about Nate Mackey's poetry seemed like, you know, tarnishment at best. So 
Um, the perspective I had on watching this will make itself clear, but it's really focused on Henry. A plane flies into the head of Henry Grimes, declining right to left over the surface of sky, forth going back over brackish, his silhouette extra mundane and animating the taproot of his will, spiraling past limits of throne, ever spilling further elsewhere, his grip claps mint into quilting, past clouds, past the seven, to the fixed stars occluded by light, knowing fullness is a field, is a set of values assigned to every location in space and time. My mind's body's tight with his kaleidoscopic kinship, base upholding essence, mustering flesh, and a poker face delivery system. His pearl at full gallop is four and five is nine, and nine is supposed to be everything. Another plane flies into the head of Henry Grimes, candid in raptness, his ear takes in without rupture, he anchors iteration of uncharted, swerve, pivot, small clearances, and the wind behind see-through tracing ecstasy, sulfagio frequencies, chartered by early green and the galaxy scratched in the lower bout, reaching deeper than turbulence, deeper than slumber, selves infinitely ranging and mounting as chorus effects, as counterweight to flurry and perturbing numbness to excitation. The head of Henry Grimes receives another plane, stanic push to land in pattern space for New Jersey, alien dome that can take it, can absorb wingspan and turbine in the line of casting in synchronicity with mythic lingering. His tune obliging capsized brushwork of souls bobbing in elemental lack, beseeching through unbrushed teeth, rising through perforations, through punctures and bliss, to a tonic interlace of the unbegotten refrain. A fenestration of scales, investments struck from telluric framing, collected feet ready to lift off. Notes unspooling without portion control, from woodshed to the serpentine path of whereto we speed, set for passage through manifold boundaries where what was once parceled is made one again. He sets the book on the body before confounding ground control. Can't somebody smile? Can't somebody be a king? On a higher plane above the head of Henry Grimes, jet trails pierce azure and disperse in cirrus, unobstructed by inner walls, his denouement suspending, bracing, bridging, holding so much aloft. And my last poem is called Cloud in the Shape of Western of a Western in Syndication. <laughs> um, I thought about writing this when I was reading Ed Dorn in the laundromat during the during the Superman. And there was uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo Lamas TV show. He shows up on a motorcycle and is a hero or something. You know that guy? Oh, yeah. Right. Long hair, yeah. big pants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is, he was in a cowboy town or something, so that's what this, this is where this comes from. In postmodern Wyoming, the rodeo is branded golf tees and the sundry words for saxophone playing allegiance to an unburied hatchet where itinerant ghosts exhale cakes served from the tread of a boot, where no count rigs the cowhand's bull rope to get thrown early, not knowing this plan won't last and will backfire like all subterfuges from the fully shaded scoot of a shadow cast by an opaque object. There is real blood found in the broken ring depiction of blood on the sacred tree with nine fronds. There are six ways to mount a horse, one with two bullets in the back, the rest fictions of the moving target. History retreats past ruffled feathers, repeats as used condoms tossed by the hero to the vacuum where his spirit was spent before a fish wrapped in newsprint is dropped on his stoop. He hopes this crest won't sound again in a future that makes sense, despite flames lifting to a curtaining aesthetic, and spring tides riding the bad luck of harvest into the perigee syzygy of earth, moon, sun. Through the filter of text, the barrel racer wonders how her range might scale beneath bruised skies over open grazing that echo the recital of her next remove like a bugle declaring Chuck. Listening closely to the ether, she dreams of St. Elmo's fire on the horns of the first cut, or Watusi weedy after too much black sage, and decides utterance is for those who desire to locate glistening. 
Long weary with second bananas, the clown takes leave of divinity through a small yard of daffodils under a constellation of twenty dimes, backslides to buckaroo thinking. You know what? Chicken butt. You know why? Cow pie. <laughs> This week, Jen Brevin, tomorrow, Bourbon. right? Bourbon. Bourbon. Six o'clock. How do you say it? Jen Bourbon. Yeah. Bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. Bourbon. Yeah. Six o'clock at Massart. Massart. Yeah. This is she's responsible for the gorgeous nothings. If you don't know her, and she's reading yeah. her new poems. Yeah, Silk so, silkworm poems. And then uh, I know Fanny Howe's reading. We're debating if it's Wednesday or Thursday, but it's I'll at Harvard. Um, and next up here will be late May, uh, and Askel Melanchuk is going to bring. Uh, a, a, smattering of uh, his press uh, people in, uh, which will include uh, Christina Davis and um, Thomas Sayers Ellis, who hasn't been around forever to me. Oh, great. It's great to see him who ran one of the single greatest reading series that I've ever been to over at the uh, museum, because it had a jazz band that you sat 20 minutes before the reading would start, and then the people would read, there'd be a break for the jazz band, and then you'd come back for more readers. It was just a delight, and he's a very fine poet himself. Uh, anything else going on that we need to know about? Fanny's Wednesday. Your Wednesday, yeah, 6 o'clock. That's at, the at Holden Holden Library. Yeah. And, uh, uh, not to be missed, uh, Fanny's has been getting better and better and better. And Who's she reading with? You have it there? Yeah, with um, John Keane. John Keane, oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And she also, apparently, I didn't know this, but her, her latest book actually has to do with uh, a white slave, and in attendance will be a descendant of that slave. Wow. Interesting. I wow. don't know about this book. Cool. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you both thank you. for being thank here. You. I mean, thank I, I kept everyone. thinking as you were reading, uh, that there was that, I, I, can, I haven't been able to find it, but there was a, a, an essay by Gary Snyder where he had a vision. This is back in the 60s that we had re-entered the troubadour era where poets were going from town to town and bringing tales and uh, yeah <laughs> that's what i felt as you two came in thank you it's a tremendous tremendous room. thank you all for coming relax please eat and have a